And if you would, we're going to pray as we get into the message this evening. Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you for all that you're bringing forth this night. Thank you for the truth. Thank you, Father, we will about walk in the truth and proclaim it. Thank you for all that you bring forth this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We're going to be sharing with you tonight on the subject of the truth about Easter and also the truth about the time of the birth and the de death of Jesus Christ, which is important for us to understand. It's important to know about the truth about Easter because most everybody out there calls this particular time Easter. You get all the emails that I get from all these companies, it's all talking about Easter. All the uh, emails I get from Christians are talking about Easter. They don't know the truth. We must know the truth. And so we're going to talk about the study about Easter and the truth about it. First of all, Easter is a time the whole world observes this holiday. Many Christians also observe it throughout the world. They believe it's all about the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Well, let's think about that for a moment. We're going to look at John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Whoops, that was not the right thing to do. John chapter 15. And we see over here in verse 19. It says, If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, but I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Well, if the world hates Christians, and Easter is all about the resurrection of Jesus, why are they celebrating it? It doesn't match up, does it? It doesn't line up whatsoever. They should hate the things that Christians are involved in. But the whole world is involved in the worship of, of the, essentially, of what this is all about. They don't realize it, but it is all worship of a false religion. We see the world hates Christians. So why does the world celebrate the same holiday as Christians? Most non-Christians have rejected Jesus as Lord and Savior, so there'd be no reason for them to be involved in it. Something certainly is wrong. So we must investigate what Easter is all about. Since the world celebrates Easter, we must look at its historical roots, find out why they celebrate it. Since most all Christians celebrate Easter, we must find out why they celebrate it as well. Regarding the origin of Easter, the true origin of Easter goes back to paganism. The word Easter can be traced to the pagan goddess named Ishtar, who is a Babylonian goddess of the rising light of the day and spring. The English word Easter comes from the Anglo-Saxon word Eostor, E-O-S-T-R-E, and Estera, who is a Teutonic goddess of the Saxons, who, to whom sacrifice was offered in the spring. Nimrod, he was the one who led rebellion against God. His name actually means rebellion. He led apostasy against God. He led the people into false religion, he, into idolatry. He believed in reincarnation and the sensual enjoyment without the fear of wrath from a holy God. And remember, he was involved in his first kingdom was Babel, and the one who was building that, that uh, city to, go, to reach to the heavens and that tower, which was about false religion away from God. He was killed by Shem because he was so evil. He was honored by the people, though, as a hero, and they mourned for him. His wife's name was Semiramis. She declared him to be the sun god and the savior of the world, which was a lie. Semiramis declared that Nimrod gave up his life. The devil's always got a lie to bring Gave up his life for the good of mankind. <laughs> no. She later became pregnant and claimed it was a supernatural conception. She gave birth to a son named Tammuz, who she said was Nimrod reincarnated as the sun god, which of course was a lie. Semiramis herself, she deified herself as the queen of heaven. And you'll see scriptures about the queen of heaven in a moment. 
and the mother of gods and raised herself to divinity. She was godlike, a goddess, just like a, a, a Nimrod. Well, pagans, you must understand, worship the sun god, who is really the devil. They worship the sun god and their various gods and goddesses through all kinds of names and symbols, various names and symbols. The Babylonian false religion proclaimed the false messiah through mystery symbols. That was the origin of Easter because of these mystery symbols. Easter is all about pagan worship of the spring goddess. It's the mod Easter is the modern form of the names of the goddesses in ancient civilizations. This can be found from history, studying it. Ishtar was the Babylonian spring goddess. Eostor was the Anglo-Saxon goddess of the spring. Ostera was the goddess in Germany. Ishtar was called the goddess in Nineveh. These are all very similar names, but they were the goddesses that they would worship. They just had different names that they'd use. These symbols is what they used to worship. They did it through mystery symbols. The first mystery symbol we look at is the egg. Uh, they had their sacred eggs used in their religious rites of the pagans. The Babylonians in the Bacchus festival, which is a time of drunkenness and sexual, uh, anything goes, and just total debauchery, they had a ceremony of consecration of the sacred egg. This is also done in Egypt and also in Greece. The Hindus, Hindus had their golden egg. The Japanese had their brazen egg. And the Chinese had their dyed or painted eggs. That's where it started with the, the painting or the dyeing of the eggs. Ashtar was the queen of heaven, they called her. The sacred egg, they declared that the wondrous size was said to have fallen from heaven into the river Euphrates, where the fish rolled it to the bank, the doves settled on it and hatched out, and out came the goddess Ashtar, also known as Venus. Ashtar was considered the great blessing to mankind, and the egg became the symbol of Ashtar. Well, she was also called the Queen of Heaven, proclaimed to be the deified Queen of Heaven, worshipped as the mother of mankind and the incarnation of the Spirit of God. A big lie. Because the Queen of Heaven is said to have given birth to Tammuz, see, the sun god, or Nimrod, resurrected. So Easter is all about the worship of Ishtar, Ashtar, declaration of the death and the resurrection of Tammuz. They believe that when he died, then he was resurrected as the sun god. Of course, he's a counterfeit of the real one. The devil always has a counterfeit, and this is his counterfeit of Jesus. We come to then about the egg hunt. The pagans believe that the eggs give new life. The egg hunt was to find a new egg to receive blessing from the spring goddess. That's why they went after those. It's amazing how we know the world has their egg hunts, but it's amazing how many churches have their egg hunts. <laughs> Boy, that's an abomination. Here they got they're going to receive the blessing from the spring goddess. This is where the tradition of the Easter egg, egg hunt came, of course. The second symbol is the one of the hare. The hare was the symbol of the moon and considered a sacred animal and was sacrificed to the goddess Ishtar. The oldest symbol of fertility, it is, the hare is, because it's the fastest procreating creature. Hare with his eyes always open signified the fertility goddess always watching over the pagans to bring fertility and also renewed life and good luck and all kinds of blessings. The hare, of course, involved into the Easter bunny. Third symbol was the use of cakes. The breads, the cakes, hot cross buns of Good Friday were used in worship of the Queen of Heaven, the Easter Goddess. And we see about these in Jeremiah. Let's go over to Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 18. Jeremiah 7, verse 18. The Bible speaks of these things. These aren't things that just came out of nowhere. I mean, these are things that the Word of God declares. Jeremiah 7, verse 18. He says, the children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead their dough, or their cakes, to make their cakes to the Queen of Heaven. That was how they worshipped, the Queen of Heaven. And to pour out their drink offerings unto other gods, that they may provoke me to anger. We see another reference in Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 44, over in verse 19. 
And when we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings under her, did we make her cakes to worship her? These cakes were used to worship her, see? And pour out the drink offerings under her without our men? That's what they were doing. They were doing all of these evil things. So the Egyptians also did this. They used their cakes in worship of Isis, their mother goddess. The Greeks made their cakes to the goddess Diana. Remember in the word where they were crying out, yelling out Diana because they were worshipers of her as a goddess, trying to shout down, you know, them from preaching the gospel or yelling about Diana. <laughs> this is true. These things were happening. This isn't mythology. This is reality that was going on. The buns were not offered, but they were, they were now are not offered, but they're eaten. But the next one, this fourth symbol of the goddess worship is wearing new clothes. What's the custom at this time? Wear new clothes, and the purpose of it was to bring good luck. That's why they did it, from their goddess. They'd go to the temple of Babylon, and they'd welcome in the spring goddess and make their baby bonnets and their new suits. The modern custom of wearing Easter bonnets and bu buying new suits came from all this, and the whole purpose was to get good luck and some kind of blessing from their goddess. Easter also involved Tammuz. Tammuz is the illegitimate child of Semiramis, who was declared, though, to be a reincarnation of, T of Nimrod, who was killed by Shem, remember. Tammuz, the son of Semiramis, declared to be the reincarnation of Nimrod, the sun god, the savior of the world. What a lie. See, the devil's always got a counterfeit of some sort. Tammuz was killed by a wild boar at age 40. In Ezekiel chapter 8, we'll read in a moment, the women were weeping for Tammuz and the men were worshiping the sun god. What a great abomination. This was happening in the temple. How terrible is that? Well, we see this in Ezekiel chapter 8. Ezekiel chapter 8, we pick up in verse 13. He said unto me, Turn ye yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. This was going on in the temple. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. They weren't worshiping the true and living God. They were worshiping the sun God. They were involved in idolatry. Then said he unto me, thou hast, hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee let again, and I'll, you'll see greater abominations than these. He brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about twenty and five, tw five and twenty men, twenty-five men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east. And they worshiped the sun toward the east. Evil things that were going on. This was going on in the temple. These guys weren't following the way of the Lord whatsoever. Well, these are great abominations that were happening. The pagans believed that Tammuz was resurrected and went to heaven as the sun god. A big lie, of course, after he got killed by the boar. In honoring him, the pagans had a great annual feast celebrating his resurrection. So they instituted a 40-day fast prior to this festival. That's 40 days for the 40 years of his life. And they were claiming his resurrection was Satan's attempt to deceive mankind by proclaiming, uh, this is Satan's attempt to deceive mankind by proclaiming a counterfeit Messiah, which of course is what they're proclaiming. The tradition of eating ham is traced to the death of Hamus, Tammuz as well. That's customary at this time. Because a wild boar killed him, the pagans ate him in retaliation for his death. That's where the modern-day tradition of eating ham at Easter came from. The sunrise service also is at this time, <clears throat> as many Christians have believed that Jesus was raised at sunrise. <laughs> it's a lie. He was not raised at sunrise. Many Christians, many churches have had their sunrise service. <laughs> well, the pagans met at sunrise to worship the sun god. The Mithraeus, that was the religion that was in operating at the same time when Jesus was here on his earthly ministry, the time of Jesus on earth. They met at dawn and they honored the sun god. As we said, many churches have sunrise services. 
thinking that Jesus was resurrected at sunrise. Well, we're going to look at John chapter 20, verse 1. John chapter 20, verse 1, makes it clear Jesus was not resurrected at sunrise. Look what it says. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark. Sun hadn't come up yet. Under the sepulcher, and see at the stone taken away from the sepulcher. She, then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said, They've taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher. We know not where they've laid him. Peter went forth, the other disciple, and they came to the sepulcher, and both ran together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, came first to the sepulcher, stooping down, looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then comes Simon Peter, followed him, went into the sepulcher, sees the linen clothes lying there, and saw the napkin, napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. So he went in with the other disciple, came first to the sepulcher, saw and believed. So as yet they didn't know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So they went back away to their home, it says. But Mary stood at the sepulcher weeping. As she wept, she, stood, she thought they'd, somebody took him away. She stooped down and looked into the sepulcher, and two angels were there, seeing two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say to her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they've taken away my Lord, and I know not where they've laid him. And when she had said this, she turned back and saw Jesus standing. Didn't know it was Jesus at the time. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She supposed him to be the gardener, said, Sir, if you have borne him hence, let me tell me where you've laid him, and I'll take him away. She still was thinking that. Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned herself and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master, as he had revealed himself unto her. He was raised from the dead, alive. And of course he said, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren, say to them, I send to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. That's because he couldn't touch her, she couldn't touch him because he hadn't taken his blood up to heaven to cleanse the heavenly things that have been contaminated. And so he didn't want to be touched by anybody. He was going to take his blood up and, and of course, cleanse the heavenly things in heaven. So, clearly, we see it was dark. It was yet dark. So would there be any reason to have a sunrise service? No. What was the reason? It's because they worshiped the sun god. He was not resurrected at sunrise. Sunrise worship is about Tammuz, a false messiah, as the sun god. It is a lie. How about what the church thought about Easter? The early church never celebrated Easter whatsoever. No trace of Easter celebration in the New Testament at all. The word Easter is translated one time in Acts 12, verse 4. People have said, what do you mean Easter is in the Bible? They must have believed in that. It's translated erroneously from the word Pascha. Let's look at Acts 12, verse 4. Acts 12, verse 4. When they had apprehended him, they put him in prison, delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Let's put the cursor over the word Easter. It's the word Pascha, talking about the Passover. In fact, this word, when you look at the usage of it, it is used 29 times, this word is, the Greek word. 28 times translated Passover correctly, what it means. One time erroneously translated Easter. It doesn't mean Easter, it means Passover. It's amazing that King James Version people that want to believe that that's a perfect Bible, when you show them this verse, they try to do everything they can to try to explain this one away, but you can't explain this one away because this is an error in the translation. It is not what the word Pascha does not mean Easter whatsoever. So, this is, he's not in, Easter is not in the Bible. It is all a lie. So, translated 29 times New Testament, 28 times correctly as Passover, one time erroneously as Easter. It should be translated Passover as we see. So what does the church celebrate? 
Christians celebrated the fulfillment of the feast of the Lord. Jesus became sin for us on the cross in fulfillment of the feast of Passover on that very day. Jesus bore away our sins when he went to hell for three days and three nights, paying the price for sin in fulfillment of the feast of unleavened bread, the second feast at that time. And Jesus was raised from spiritual death unto spiritual life after three days and three nights in hell. And then he was resurrected bodily and went to heaven as the firstborn of all creation in fulfillment of the feast of first fruits. That's what we celebrate. That's what it's all about. Does the world celebrate the feast of the Lord? Never. They, they, they don't have anything to do with it whatsoever. But they celebrate Easter, which is all about paganism. The early church had nothing to do with the pagan idolatrous observances. We've talked about that in the past, about nothing to do with Christmas, and they have nothing to do with Easter whatsoever. But it did come into the church, unfortunately, in the compromise that occurred. In 313 A.D., Constantine, who supposedly was converted to Christianity, made Christianity the state religion which gave rise to the Roman Catholic Church. He was trying to get everybody to come into the church. Well, in order to get everybody to be happy about that, they brought in uh, the pagan traditions and mixed them together with the things of, of, the, of the Word of God and thought that that would be good for everybody. So to get the pagans to come in the state church, many pagan customs were brought into the church. The merger of Christianity and paganism brought a great number of adherents to the Roman Catholic Church because they, they had had a problem prior to that. Diocletian was the emperor before him, and he created havoc in killing many Christians. Well, when Constantine came on the scene, he didn't want to see that happen anymore, so he changed the whole deal and decided he's going to make it the state church and merge together all these things. We've talked about it in the past about the Christmas one where the birthday of the unconquered sun god was December 25th. And so to please the pagans, they changed the birth of Jesus and made it December 25th. So that meant that it would be the same time as the pagans' birthday of the sun god. Everybody be happy, which is a big lie. So this is the deception. The church there had fallen away. Now true born-again Christians didn't go for this whatsoever. So to please the pagans, Constantine decreed the celebration of Easter on the Sunday following the vernal equinox at the Roman Catholic Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D. <laughs> Just because it was at some council, some people think, well, that must have been okay. No, it wasn't okay. It was compromise with the pagans. Many pagan rites celebrated at the vernal equinox became a part of the church Easter celebration. One pagan custom included was the worship of the spring goddess through the egg. The Roman Catholic Church even adopted the mystic egg of Ashtar, Ashtar. and that was, the pagans liked that one, consecrated it as a symbol of Christ's resurrection. No, it's not a symbol of Christ's resurrection at all. It's a lie. Pope Paul the v, the v taught to pray at Easter, Bless, O Lord, we beseech thee, this thy creature of eggs, that's crazy. Not a creature of eggs. Eating it in remembrance of our Lord Jesus Christ, merging that all together. It's astounding the things that they did. What about Lent? The Roman Catholic Church instituted the 40 day period preceding Easter called Lent. Remember, they had the 40 day fast for, you know, for the 40 years of, of uh, Tammuz's life. Lent comes from the Anglo-Saxon word lengthen, which means spring, pointing towards the spring goddess worship. Lent was, is 40 days abstinence directly borrowed from the worshipers of the Babylonian god and goddess. And Lent was the 40-day fast in honor of Tammuz prior to the annual festival of the resurrection of Tammuz, which is what Easter is about as well. It's all a lie. The Roman Catholic Church appeased the pagans to merge paganism, Christianity, by decreeing the solemn observance at Lent, of Lent at the Council of Aurelia in 519 A.D. This is the Catholics, false religion, you know, by Hormistus, who was the Bishop of Rome. Compromise. And fortunately, that's what was going on at this time. The merger of Lent and Easter with the celebration of the death and resurrection of Christ resulted in Jesus becoming as Tammuz to the pagans. They mixed it together. 
The early church never observed Lent or Easter, but instead they proclaimed Jesus' fulfillment of the first three feasts of the Lord. How many churches have done that? And how many churches do that? Hardly any. It's amazing how they have not studied the Word of God and found out the truth and even looked at this from a historical standpoint. Should any Christian observe Easter? Absolutely not. It would have nothing to do with it. Why? Of course, because the modern traditions are the same as the pagan traditions. Same thing we saw with Christmas. They got all the Christmas traditions and they merge it all together, you know. Used in the false worship of the sun god and the goddess. So, if these are the pagan traditions used in false worship of the sun god and goddess, why are those traditions continually kept? Because that's what it's all about. It's all about worship of a false god. Here's the summary of the symbols to give a reminder for us. The egg was a symbol of the spring goddess in reincarnated form. The egg hunt, find an egg to receive blessing from the goddess. The hare, the symbol of fertility goddess who watched over all with eyes open for fertility and renewed life evolved into the Easter bunny tradition. Breads, cakes, hot cross buns of Good Friday, which is a lie too, as we'll talk about in a minute, used in worship of the Queen of Heaven. Sacred buns offered to gods, now eaten at festivals. And then we have Lent, the 40 days of fasting, weeping, and wailing for Tammuz. What a lie. Eating of ham, kill the thing that killed their god, Tammuz, by eating it. Sunrise worship, worship of the sun god and a false messiah. And new clothes, welcome in the spring goddess, obtain the good luck, wear the new bonnets and the suits and all that. It's all an abomination. Well, knowing this, why do Christians celebrate this holiday since it's pagan? Number one, many don't know its pagan origin. They, don't, they haven't been taught correctly. And those who are the ministers and the churches and heads of those, they should find this out and should have been teaching the truth. But instead, they don't teach the truth themselves. Most of them have found out, but they ignore it. But there's some that haven't found it out at all. Others know it, and ignore, but ignore it and continue its observance by changing the pagan meanings into Christian meanings. The egg. Oh, we're going to say the egg's a symbol of new life in the resurrection of Christ. <laughs> Not true. You can't decide you're going to make it what you want it to be. Sunrise service, a symbol of the resurrection of Christ. It's a lie. He wasn't raised at sunrise. Clearly, these are lies. Others ignore its pagan roots and just enjoy spring holiday and declare that they're celebrating the resurrection of Christ while continuing to follow the Easter customs. Well, if you're going to follow the same customs, you know, how can you do that and to proclaim that's the resurrection of Jesus? If you're going to believe in the resurrection of Jesus, why would you follow the pagan customs? Others celebrate this holiday because of their children. Well, we can't disappoint the children now. They reason the children will feel left out if they can't participate in the Easter egg hunt, you know, and all the other observances. <laughs> yeah, what, what's the answer for the children? The answer is you teach them the truth so they know it's not of God and why they should not participate in it. You also teach them the truth about the fulfillment of the feast of the Lord by Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. Hardly any child knows anything about that. The feast of the Lord? They don't know anything about it because they haven't been taught. This is to all Christians who celebrate it. And maybe if you're hearing this for the first time, this may be really rattling you and you might be making you think, wow, should I really be celebrating it? Well, to all the Christians who celebrate it, number one, the truth is you cannot convert Easter into something it's not and make it whatever you want it to be. You can't change the pagan meanings into Christian meanings. That's ridiculous. It is what it is, isn't it? You cannot ignore the pagan roots and continue to retain and follow the pagan customs because they're symbols of idolatry and false worship. The egg, the hare, the Easter bunny, you know, all these things, eating the hot cross buns, all this stuff. You can't make Easter what you want it to be. It is what it is. 
it is not about the resurrection of Christ. It's about the proclaiming of a false Messiah, Tammuz, and about goddess worship. It's all a lie. We've got to consider the truth. If you participate in Lent, uh, lots of Christians have gone through their little 40 days thing, you know. Think about what they do before that, you know. They have the Ash Wednesday and they put this thing on their head, you know, this a little uh, ashes on their head and then they go through their 40 days. What do they do before that? That's when they have the Mardi Gras crazy time of just total debauchery. <laughs> Terrible. We're just going to live it up and get drunk and do all these things and now we're going to be religious, you know. <laughs> Boy, if that isn't ridiculous. If you participate in Lent or Easter, you're not observing a modern day holiday, but in reality, you're honoring and embracing all of the ancient traditions of Babylon, fa fa Babylonian false religion and worship of the sun god and the goddess, including, and this is the bad one, acknowledging Tammuz as the false messiah. Uh, you can't be doing that. That's idolatry. You're in trouble with the Lord to do that. Secondly, you need to let your children be involved, to, to let your children be involved, allow them to be involved in idolatry and false worship, whether you know it or not. We can't do that. 1 John 5.21 says, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Let's look at that scripture. It's at the very end of 1 John. And remember, it summed up everything in John there, and so many important things are there in verse 20. And it says that we know the Son of God's come and has given us an understanding that we may know Him that's true, and we are in Him that's true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. That's the summation of all that. And then, of course, He warns them. Now, little children, keep yourselves. This word keep actually is the word philosophy, which means to guard. You are to guard yourself from idols. And this is a command. Have people been guarding themselves from anything that's idolatry? If they've been involved in the Easter, they sure have not been guarding themselves the way they should. What are we to do? Stand up and reject Lent and Easter and celebrate the fulfillment of the Feast of the Lord by Jesus Christ? by proclaiming the truth of what he accomplished through his death and resurrection. Remember, the feasts of the Lord are not Jewish feasts. They're God's feasts. They have nothing to do with the Jewish thing. It's all pointing towards Jesus Christ. They were rehearsals where they had to meet together, remember, holy meetings and the rehearsals pointing towards what Jesus would do when he came in the fulfillment of them. Now we're going to talk to you about the time of the birth and the death of Jesus Christ. This is another important area because there's some people, ministers out there, that say Jesus was born in the spring. It's crazy. He wasn't born in the spring. If I named their names, you'd know who they are because they're, they're well known. They're, that's ridiculous. Jesus was not born in the spring. He was born in the time of fall. We know that because that was the time of the tax. That was the time, remember, when that, the, the, we saw all the different times over in Luke chapter 2. In fact, we might even look at that for a moment. Jesus was not born at the time of the spring. Luke 2, 1. Came to pass in those days that went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Well, when would the time be best for taxing? End of the harvest, right? Not at the beginning of it. That would be crazy. They didn't have any money then. First taxing was made when Cyrenus was governor of Syria. All went to be taxed. Everyone had to go to their own city. And they went up here, the city of Nazareth. They had to go to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was the house and lineage of David. To be taxed with Mary as a spouse's wife, being great with child. So while they were there, the days were accomplished. She should be delivered. So this is the time brought forth their firstborn child, wrapped in a swaddling clothes, laying him in a manger, because there was no room in the inn. Why was there no room in the inn? Because everybody was there for the feast of the Lord, tabernacles. Everybody was there at that time. They were in the same country, the shepherds abiding in the field, watching over their flocks by night. They were doing that. This is prior to when the rainy season came in. And so the angels came, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were all so afraid. 
And so this is the time of the fall of the year. The other reason you know this, because of the fact that when Jesus entered into his ministry, it said he was about 30 years old. Well, when was that? That was the time of the fall of the year when he started his ministry, the seventh month, tenth day, which is the Day of Atonement, as he began to bring the destruction against the works of the devil, and he ministered for three and a half years, casting out the demons, healing the sick, bringing forth the truth, proclaiming all the things of the New Testament that were going to come into being. Three and a half years. Well, and then when was Jesus crucified? It was in the spring. Well, three and a half years means he would have been born in the fall. Jesus was born in the fall, not in the spring. It is unbelievable that people would even think that. There's quite a lack of agreement, though, among Christians regarding the time of the birth and death of Jesus Christ. There shouldn't be. It brings confusion to the body of Christ and also to the world. This is important that we understand this. The effects of the confusion is this. Without knowing these dates, we will not know when Jesus was crucified and when the church age began. And that's important because we need to know when the church age ends. If we don't know when the church age began, then we'll not know when the church age ends, which is after 2,000 years. If we don't know the end of the church age, we'll not know when the tribulation begins as well. Now, one of the things we want to mention is this. We know the fact that Leviticus, and we've seen this, chapter 23 in verse 4 talks about these feasts, and then the first one is listed in verse 5. In the 14th day of the first month, that is Passover, the feast of Passover. That's when Jesus died. And remember, the next one begins the next day, which is unleavened bread. Jesus was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. After that, then the day after that is the day when it was the morrow after the Sabbath. We know that because we come down to verse um, 10 when he talks about the bringing the first fruits. Verse 11 says, you wave the sheep of the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath. So, there's the day that he's on the cross. There's 72 hours, three days and three nights in between. And then there's the morrow after the Sabbath, which would be Sunday, the first day of the week. So we need to find a time when there's one day, there's three days in between, and then we come to the first day of the week afterwards. What day would that have to be? It'd have to be a Wednesday, wouldn't it? Wednesday, because then the three days would be Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And then the next day after the Sabbath, which was Saturday, that may be Sunday. So that means we got to find the time when Jesus died on Wednesday. Well, you must understand that God's calendar is a lunar calendar. And the lunar calendar is not the same as a solar calendar. Our days change in our calendar compared to the lunar calendar. They're different. We're going to look at... calendars. First of all, 30 AD, which is the true time when Jesus went to the cross. If you look up here and you see this right here, this is Nisan. Nisan, day 14, right here. This is the calendar, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Wednesday, on in, in 20, 30 AD was on, that was the 14th day of Nisan. So we know it has to be on a Wednesday, so that's one possibility. Let's take a look at uh, 29 AD. This is the year before that. Nisan day, here's Nisan, day 14, it's over here, it's on a Saturday. Well, it certainly couldn't have been then, because you can't fit three days and three nights from Saturday to Sunday morning, it doesn't work whatsoever. And how about the 28th? Here we have Nisan. Here's day 14. That's on a Monday that week. 
Well, that won't work either. Monday and then three days and three nights, that doesn't get us past Saturday to, for the Sunday. That would be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then now we're in, come across Friday. So we know it can't be then. Well, let's look at 31. Nisan, day 14, is also on a Wednesday. So now we found a second possibility. We have 30 AD was on a Wednesday. We have 31 AD is on a Wednesday. Well, let's look at the next one. This is 32 AD. Nisan is on the 14th day on a Monday. And it can't be that one. We can rule that one out for sure. How about the next one, 33 AD? And this is a one that a lot of scholars, a lot of Christians believe, and you'll see why. Nisan day 14, what day is it? It's on a Friday. Well, that fits with a good Friday deal, doesn't it? When they believe that it was on Friday. There's only one problem with Good Friday. If he died at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on Friday, and he's raised before Sunday morning at 6 a.m., remember, it's while he's yet dark. If you add the number of hours from 3 o'clock in the afternoon on Friday, let's just take it to get to 6 a.m. on Sunday, that's 39 hours. Well, that doesn't work because three days and three nights is 24 hours times three, that's 72 hours. It doesn't fit, does it? So could Jesus have died on Good Friday, as everybody proclaims? No, it is a lie. And this is the, this is the year that they claim, 33 AD that it was, it's the only one that fits. And so it's gotta fit into them somehow, so they claim that on Friday was the day, which is a lie. Not so impossible. And we'll also point out another reason why that's impossible in a moment. Let's go over to 34. Nissan day 14 is on a Wednesday. Well, that's another possibility. Now we have three possibilities, 30 AD, 31 AD, or 34 AD, what it would work. And then we come to 35. And this one, it's on a Monday. So we can pretty much rule that out. So we come to now realizing there's only three possible dates, 30 AD, 31 AD, or 34 AD. Now, when Jesus was born, remember that he, was, he started his ministry when he was about 30 years old. And he ministered for three and a half years. So that would be 33 and a half years. So if we go back from these times, 30 AD, 31 AD, and 34 AD, and we go back these 33 and a half years, then we're gonna look for the date when Jesus was born. And that's important to realize. There is no zero year. So if we took 30 AD, for example, and we went back to one AD, that's 29 years. And we went one year to one BC, there's no zero year, so that would now be 30 years. And then we went back um, another uh, three, three, three and a half years, which would really be into the fourth year, that would take us to 5 BC. So if it was 30 AD that he was crucified, that meant his birth would be in 5 BC. If it was 31 AD, which is a possibility, that means his birth was in 4 BC. If it was 34 AD, which is a possibility, that means his birth was in 1 BC. And the 33 AD that they claim for the Good Friday one, well, that would mean the fact that his birth was in 2 BC. Well, that's not going to work, as you will see. Now, another thing we need to realize is about Daniel, Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy. Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy is something that we need to be aware of. Daniel 70 weeks prophecy, in fact, we'll go over and look at that in Daniel, because this ties in with it as well. Chapter 9, verse 24. Remember, this is the 70 weeks determined on the people and upon the holy city. 
to finish the transgression, make an end of sins, make a reconciliation for iniquity, bring an everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision and prophecy, and anoint the most holy, which Jesus fulfilled all of those, as we've talked about. Well, verse 25 says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah, that's the anointed one, the prince, which means the ruler. That would mean when he started to proclaim his ministry, operating his ministry, bringing the kingdom of God, preaching it, that would be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Three score, at 60, 62, plus the seven is 69 weeks. So we have 69 weeks, and these weeks are weeks of year, of seven years. A week is seven years. Seven times the 69 is 483 years. Well, if we look at the 483 years, we have to go back to the time when this would have started. And that was during the decrees that were made there were different decrees. Some decrees were made for the building of the temple, the restoration of the temple. Cyrus made one, and there were other, others made some of these decrees. But the one that dealt with for the decree of the rebuilding of the city as well, not just the house, but also the city, was in Ezra chapter 7, verse 21, talking about Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes makes a decree, and this was in 458, B.C. E I, even I, Artaxerxes the king, do make a decree to all the treasures which are beyond the river, that whatsoever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, shall require of you, it shall be done speedily. So they gave him all this silver and wheat and the wine and oil and everything, the things that they had need of. And they said there, whatsoever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be diligently done for the house of the God of heaven. Well, that's not the city, that's the house. For why should there be wrath against the realm of the king and his sons? Also, we certify you that touching any of the priests and Levites, singers, porters, nethermans, and ministers of the house of God, it shall not be lawful to impose toll, tribute, or custom upon them. So this is their coming to build the house. And thou, Ezra, after the wisdom of thy God that is in thine hand, set magistrates, those are judges. You don't have judges in the temple. Judges are in the city and judges, which may judge all the people that are beyond the river, all such as know the laws of thy God and teach ye them that know them not. So what he's talking about now is that which would rule a city, because he's talking about the restoration of the city and involve the city, remember? Whosoever will not do the law of thy God or the law of thy kingdom, let judgment be executed speedily upon him, whether it be unto death or banishment or convocation, confiscation of goods or imprisonment. What's that talking about? That's talking about a city, government, that would be come, come for. So this is the decree by Artaxerxes to build not only the house, but also the city, the restoration of the city, and have government come into it. 483 years. Well, when did that begin? 458 A.D. If we take 458 and we go to 1 B.C., that's 457 years. We go 1 B.C. to 1 A.D., that's one more, so we have 458. And then we have 25 more years to get us to 483. 1 A.D. plus 25 brings us to 26 A.D. That would be the time when Jesus started his ministry, and that's exactly right because he did start his ministry in 26 A.D. when he was about 30 years old. That's another thing that gives us an idea of when he was born. Because if it was 26 A.D., we go back 25 years to 1 A.D., one more year, now we're at 26 years, back to 1 B.C., and then we go another four years to about 30, that's back to 5 B.C. That's another reason why we know that Jesus was born in 5 B.C., because he started his ministry in 26 A.D., which is the time that fulfills the 483 years of Artaxerxes' decree. So this happened. Now, there's another one that we need to look at. And this is in Matthew chapter 2. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Herod was the king at that time, 
Behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that's born king of the Jews? For we've seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. So they saw the star, and it took them some time to get there, and they came to worship him. It wasn't the time when he was actually born. He was already born. This is after he was born. We know that because when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Israel, with, all Jerusalem with him. And when he demanded all the chief priests and scribes of the people uh, to uh, gather them all together, demanded of them where Christ should be born. He wanted to know about this. He said, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it's written by the prophet. Thou Bethlehem and the land of Judah are not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. So Herod, when he called, had privily called the wise men, he inquired of them diligently what time, what was the time the star appeared? So that would have been the time of his birth, and they came from that time to, to, to where they found him. He sent him to Bethlehem said, Go and search diligently for the young child. When you found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. Of course, he's lying. He wanted, to, you know, he wanted to kill him. When they had heard the king, they departed. Lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. By the way, this star is not what's called the Bethlehem star that people talk about because stars move from east to west across. Bethlehem is north of that. This star was moving supernaturally going north. Stars don't go north and south. So they don't believe the lies about that. It's all false. This is a supernatural star that was being manifest at this time. When they come to the house, they saw the young child with Mary's mother fell down and wor worshipped him. And when they opened their treasures, they presented him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. Now notice, they saw the young child. He's not, this is a young child. Not when he was just born. He was already, had gr been around for a while, which you'll find has been about six months or so. Being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed to their own country another way. Well, when they were departed, of course, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph and said, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee into Egypt. Be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child, again, to destroy him. Now, when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. And he was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled that was spoken by the Lord, of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. And Herod, when he saw it was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth. And he sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and all the coasts thereof from two years old and under. Now why did he do that? Because he was trying to cover the whole time of when this child might have been born. So two years and under, according to the time that he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Well, that brings us to another point. Herod the time of his death. In fact, let's go back and pick up some of these things we're talking about. Here were the dates that we saw. I showed them to you first. But here's the, whoops, why is that doing that? There we go. The dates were 30 AD, Wednesday, 31 AD, Wednesday, 34 A.D. was Nisan 14 on Wednesday. The only possibilities, as we point out. If he died in 30 A.D., as we mentioned, his ministry started in 26 A.D., three and a half years before his birth would be in the fall of 5 B.C., since he was about 30 years old when he started his ministry. If he died in 31 A.D., his ministry started in 27 A.D., and his birth wouldn't be in 4 B.C., if he died in 34 A.D., then his ministry started in 30 A.D., and his birth would be in 1 B.C. We pointed out about Daniel's 69 weeks, Artaxerxes' decree to build the house, and how that brought us to 26 A.D. when his ministry began. This gives support to his birth in 5 B.C., ministry starting then, and his death in 30 A.D. Then we come to, sorry there, why is it doing that? Hmm. 
we'll get this uh, again. Sorry about this. Here we are. About Daniel's 70 weeks. So, and here's about Herod and the wise men. The wise men came to worship Jesus, having seen his star, we talked about, found out where he was born, and so he sent them to search their young child, and he ordered the killing of all of them for two years and under. So that means Jesus was less than two years old at that time. So the thing we have to know is when did Herod die? Herod died in the spring of 4 B.C. History shows that. Well, that means Jesus was either born in 5 B.C. or 6 B.C. It had to be one or the other. It couldn't have been before that. It couldn't have been 6 B.C. because that would mean Jesus was crucified in 29 A.D. when the Feast of Passover was on Saturday. Remember that 29 A.D., Nisan 14 was on a Saturday. It doesn't fit for three days and three nights from Saturday to the Sunday. So, couldn't work that way. It had to be on Wednesday, 30 A.D. Here's the Good Friday one, which is a lie. If Jesus died on Good Friday, it would have to be 33 A.D. That's the only day that was the 14th day. That was the only day that Nisan 14 during that time, on Friday. Because of this, though, many have believed that he died in 33 A.D. Well, of course, that meant he would be also not only, there's no three days and three nights in between, which we already mentioned, but also look at this. It means if he died in 33 AD, that meant he was born in 2 BC. Well, that's impossible. Herod died in 4 BC. It had to be before Herod died. Now remember, the numbers go backwards at that point. So Herod died in 4 BC, so Jesus had to be born before that date, which would be prior to 4 B.C., 5 B.C., or 6 B.C. So the Good Friday falls because you can't have three days and three nights from Friday to Sunday. It also falls because he'd have to be born at 2 B.C. at that time, which was not possible. Good Friday death is false because also, as we mentioned, the Matthew 12, 40, three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He died at 3 p.m., 72 hours. Don't fit in it. It's only 39 hours as we saw it. So Jesus was born in 5 BC. That is the answer. We've been able to see that from the time of his beginning of his ministry, from the 79, 69 weeks of Daniel. We've seen it also from the time of his birth with Herod's death very clearly. We've also seen it has to be that because it's the only one that fits Nisan 14 being on a Wednesday. It's the only one that works. Began his ministry in 26 AD, ministered three and a half years, and uh, so he died on Nisan 14 on a Wednesday, four, 20, 72 hours before being born again from spiritual death unto spiritual life. So, the conclusion about the church age, and this also affects us for the time of the tribulation, because Jesus dying in 30 A.D., that means the church age began in 30 A.D. as well. And the church age is what? <coughs> 2,000 years long, <coughs> which means the church age ends in 2030 A.D. That means the Great Tribulation starts in 2030 A.D., continues for three and a half years into the fall of 2033. Jesus will be begin his millennial reign on earth in the fall of 20. 33. Remember, there were four days, 4,000 years, from the beginning to Christ, and then two days of the church age. Remember the two days of the church age. That's because of the fact that oh, we see the two days is shown in Exodus chapter two places. Exodus chapter 19, beginning here when the Lord said to Moses, go into the people, this is in the third month, if we go back to verse one where he talks about in the third month, and what happened in the third month? That's Pentecost. That's the time of the birthday of the church. So Moses is a type of Christ. The Lord said to Moses, go into the people, sanctify them today and tomorrow. That's two days. And let them wash their clothes. 
and be ready against the third day. Well, that's after the 2,000 years. That'd be the next day, which would be the next 1,000 year period. What's going to happen that day? For the third day, the Lord will come down on the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And that's what was going to happen. So he goes down, he sanctifies the people, wash their clothes, be ready against the third day, he said. And he said, what happened on the third day? It come to pass on the third day in the morning, there were thunders and lightnings. And that's all talking about judgments. Remember the th thunders and the lightnings that come? They're all sy symbolic of judgments in Scripture. And a thick cloud, the judgments are coming on the world. And then when he comes back, he's coming back with a, in a cloud, isn't he? Thick cloud upon the mount. And when he comes with a cloud, what's going to sound? The trumpet, the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud. What's that? That's the rapture, isn't it? The feast of trumpets fulfillment. So that all the people that was in the camp trembled. So this is talking about, and it didn't say it happened at the very moment that third day started. It's in the morning, it's in the early time because Jesus starts his reign from heaven for three and a half years. It starts out with the angels attacking all the principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness, evil spirits in the heavenlies, and, casting, and defeating them and casting them down to earth. And then we have the three and a half years period of time. So this is one example of it. The other one is over in, of the two days is over in Hosea, chapter 6, verse 2. After two days... And this is really speaking to the Jew, about the Jews. Because remember, after the two days of the church age, the Jews are going to have, when the tribulation starts, the Jews have a chance to come to the Lord in the last three and a half years or half week of Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy. Remember, it was 70 years where the dealings with the Jews. 69 weeks elapsed when Jesus came on the scene and started his ministry. How long did he minister? Three and a half years. That's a half a week. So 69 and a half weeks have elapsed when he was cut off. How, how much time is left? One half week. How long is the tribulation? One half week. Three and a half years. Not seven years. It's three and a half years. 1260 days, 42 months, times time and half a time, which is all three and a half years. And so in the third day, he says after two days he's going to revive us. The Jews are going to get, they're going to get the gospel preached to them. And Romans 11 talks about that all Israel is going to be saved. They're going to receive the gospel this time. And they rejected them all along before. Two days he'll revive us. And the third day he'll raise us up. We'll live in his sight in the third day. Not at the third day, but in the third day. And this shall we know. We follow to know the Lord is going forth, as prepared as the morning. He's going to come unto us the rain, the latter and former rain unto the earth, a double portion rain is going to come, and they are going to get saved at these last times. Praise God for what is going to happen. Well, we see then the church age is 2,000 years. It ends in 2030 A.D. The Great Tribulation starts in 2030 and continues for three and a half years of the fall of 2033. And so it would begin the millennial reign then. So what's the conclusion about Easter? Easter is a pagan origin. It's about goddess worship and reclaiming a false messiah of Tammuz as Nimrod, the sun god. Good Friday's impossible. And yet almost the whole world celebrates, these Christians celebrate this Good Friday. It's astounding that they have not looked at the truth and seen this is all a lie. It's impossible, as we pointed out. It's impossible because the three days and three nights can't fit in there. It's impossible because of the fact that it's after the time when Herod had died. <laughs> it won't work, as we see. So what's the answer? Christians reject Easter and proclaim Jesus' fulfillment of Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. This is so important to understand. So, all the lies about it, it makes a confusion. People haven't known the truth. But now that we know the truth, we see beyond a shadow of a doubt, Jesus was born in 5 B.C., 26 A.D., started his ministry. 30 A.D., he went to the cross. And we even know that further because what's the time that God has for giving people a chance to repent. Forty years is a time 
40 years in the tribulation or in the, in the wilderness, remember? And how long did he give the Jews to come to the place of stopping their, their, their sacrifices that they continued in the temple after that? 40 years. From 30 AD, they continued their sacrifices to 70 AD, and that was the end. What happened in 70 AD? The temple and the city was destroyed. There wasn't even a stone left, because that was the very end. That shows also that it was 30 AD. We need to know this. So now we know. Easter's a lie, Good Friday's a lie. We celebrate the fulfillment of the feasts of the Lord and what Jesus accomplished. And we know he was born in 5 BC. And we know he started his ministry in 26 AD. And 30 AD is when he went to the cross. And then 20, 30 AD, the end of the church age. And we know that we're in these last days and what is coming. I trust this has helped you, and it's, you can see why it's important to know. If we don't know when the beginning of the church age is, we won't know when the end of it is. It means we won't know when all these things are going to happen. Well, there's people that are saying all kinds of crazy things out there. Some people think we're in the tribulation right now. It's crazy. Some people think, oh, it's going to happen in 28, 2028, a lot of people say. No, it doesn't. They think it's all going to line up with all these jubilee years and all these kind of things, or, or else the seven years... As the, the times, every seven years they think it's going to happen. No, it doesn't line up whatsoever. It's all false. This shows beyond a shadow of a doubt when the time is. And we need to know the time so we're not deceived about the things that are going to happen in the end times. Oh, there's lots of there's people even, a guy wrote a book, um, his name was Anderson, Sir Robert Anderson, he proclaiming that he's not coming back till I think it was 60, 2060 or so, something like that. It's all lies. He came up with it somehow. People have just been just totally deceived about this. That's why this is important to understand, the time of the birth and the death of Jesus. So we know the time and we understand the days we're in and what is coming so we can be prepared for what is going to happen. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the truth about Easter, revealing its pagan origin, and it's about wor goddess worship and false proclaiming of a Messiah that is not the truth. I also understand that Good Friday is a lie. Lent is a lie. I see that this Sunday sunrise service, it's a lie. Any involvement in Easter is involvement in paganism. I will not be involved in any paganism. Instead, I will proclaim the truth. Declaring what Jesus accomplished in fulfillment of the feasts of the Lord. And I also thank you that I now clearly see the birth and the death of Jesus, which shows me when the church age began, and it lines up with the scriptures on everything, so I know when the church age ends and what is going to happen. So I'm going to be ready for what is about to happen in the earth. And I will be about the Lord's business, seeing him accomplish his work in my life, to be a part of this glorious, perfected church and winning people to the Lord and being prepared for the things that are going to come. Thank you for the truth about Easter and the true time of the birth and the death of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Well, I trust this has been a help to you. We need to know this so we're not deceived by all the false teaching out there and all the different dates that people throw around and all these things. They got no other way to back it up whatsoever. This backs it up clearly through the Word of God and historically and the fact that it couldn't be any other time but 5 BC, 26 AD, 30 AD, 2030 AD. It all lines up. Praise God. Thank you, Father, for all you brought forth. So we, now we know the truth, and we thank you 
for we see it clearly in line with the Word of God in all the different aspects that we've looked at. Father, we thank you for bringing forth the truth this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Hallelujah.